then the question then is how to test it. And he's proposed one set of data or one kind of approach, not being too precise about the data, but some yeah. something. Who who wants to speak to this and um, both both on things you may have heard, thought about, other courses and what you what you've heard here? Sort of some advice or questions or comments. Yeah. So I'm in an immigration class, and there is a lot of information about how immigration does like, um, help like stir the economy and like make improvements. But it would be, I mean, you need to have more information about what your data is before you could be like, okay, it's a risk for sure, you know, correlation. Yeah, just a little bit louder. You, you need to have more data right. on, on what? Well, like, you would need to have, first I would need to know, like, you would need to know a little bit more about the data you have already. Yeah, like, of course. What kind of yeah, it sounds like you don't have any, and you're and you're so you're you're thinking about going to the internet and looking. Yes, exactly. Okay. I'm not at that point. Yet. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So, so what what would you suggest if you read some things or had the course that he looked for? Um, so there's a lot of data on. Well, so you're trying to do it for like the whole this, country. This, at a this time. is a good discussion for everybody in the class. This is a good. It's a it's a hard question, but it it fits directly with. The idea that we're, we, we want to address big international issues, but we want to use local data where we can that will add more value than if we just used big loose data. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so like that's what I'm saying. If, if you want to do it at a national scale, I think it would be a little bit more difficult. But if you chose like a specific city, yeah. Like what area. if I chose like Mobile, Alabama, or something? Yeah, and then see like okay, there's or, if, or places that have like a high surge, like Lebanon, Pennsylvania, or the one place in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. that has a big surge of immigrants. And then see, okay, it, but I would I would try to consider like everything else that could have affected the economy, like a bunch of businesses coming in, or like a big investment from some kind of thing, or like a public development project. Of course. So you know, like that would, that, that's what I would do in terms of. Um, okay. Now, no, but but at the end, so, I mean, these are good points. But let, let's talk about them a little more individually. Um, at the beginning, you said maybe the the, the U.S. national data or one city. Then you said you want to assess the importance of other things going on. How can you do that with one country or one city? You could look at like education rates if they've changed depending on the value. I don't know if that would impact it, but I think there's tons of information about stuff like that. You know, so there's no, no, but, but be careful. And it, there's tons of information, but you have to choose what to acquire and how to analyze it. We haven't talked very much explicitly about methods, but, but we, we can a little bit here, here for a minute. And this, this is a perfect illustration of why it's critical and how you'll get completely different results depending on how you structure your study. So <coughs> I mean, I've, I, I've, I've spent 30 plus years doing an oral history of Chicago. So we're studying Chicago in detail. We love the details of Chicago and the oral history and the way that people will talk about this or that. But we don't have much in the way of numbers for immigration or other stuff, which would, and that is we would never try to do this with the data we have in one city with an oral history. Because you'll get a messy answer, I would say. And so the normal way, and what, what's your major? Um, economics. Okay, especially if you're an economics major, the normal answer in economics, to definitely in economics, probably in political science, sociology is divided. You have some people who would say in sociology the same thing as in economics. Other people will say you can go and talk to the people and see see how they live and get and get get an ethnographic sense of what's going on. But for most for, for mo most people who would say, <coughs> let's say would who would take would say take a comparative approach. Don't take, if, if you want to do a national analysis, don't just take one country like Sweden or the US, take 100 countries and look at 100 rates of immigration, 100 levels of GNP. That, that is a minimum of 100 cases. Or take counties, then you have 3,000 counties in the US. Or take zip codes and you have 45,000 zip codes um, or take blocks that is and, I, and the general point I would make is the smaller the unit the larger the number of cases 
and the more variations that you can find. So, I mean, if you take just nations in Europe, you'll find, you know, little bits of variation like that. And many, and you, and if you just take, say, Western Europe, you got 25 cases or something. You can't assess the importance of other variables. You just call them other variables with a big box like that, or you can say, what about educational level within the country? Educational level of the immigrants. You know, if you're talking about engineers trained at the university, you know, in a Mexico City top university coming to Sweden, they're going to add a lot to the GNP through Volvo and, and whatever. If you're talking about people who are thieves, gangsters, that's a completely different story. <laughs> so immigration is not one to, to, to just to, just to mention one or two variables of so the patterns of the immigrants. Second, how tolerant are the employers and the kinds of firms within which they might work? Uh, I mentioned briefly the study by, <coughs> by um, a Dutchman taking the Saskia Sassen kind of analysis, and, and he basically found the opposite finding of hers. Namely, that the main reason for income inequality of, in, of immigrants being paid less was discrimination, basically, or less positive attitudes toward immigrants by the, by the employers in some Dutch cities, even though, in general, the Dutch are very, very welcoming of immigration and they're very tolerant of everybody. But even, and so if this is true within the Netherlands, it's going to be much more true in New York or uh, Japan, where, where they're open, you know, criticisms of, of, of immigration. Uh, <coughs> um, so uh, I'm, making, I'm making two, three, four points. Research design is big stuff, I mean, it will completely change your results. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when you're reading different studies, pay attention not only to the findings, the short abstract, but the abstract should tell you how did they get the data? How did they get the result? Did immigration have a positive, a negative, an impact, no impact? And what was the basis? The, the, and so they may say a multiple regression of 3,000 US counties. That's completely different from um, you know, interviews with five employers, of course. But people yeah. do all these, people publish studies of all of these kinds and more. And, and, and most of the stuff which is published is from the is from the national is from the you know the general media, and it you know it's made up by the that is it's almost made up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so in that so in that sense, so we're, we're not, we this is not a methods course, but at least but sometimes in the past, if there are people who are interested in doing a more statistical, more advanced kind of analysis, we we've got the data to do so. And usually in a class this size, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have 20 or 20 people who are really cutting edge, who know how to do this thoroughly, who've had a series of statistics courses. And you may, you may, and so we've often have two or three people collaborate. One person really knows, you know, SAS, R, multiple regression, and so forth. Other people don't at all, but, they, but they're interested in the substantive issue. A third set of people may be interested in immigration, but they don't know about, about GMP. Three people together can do a paper that no one could do alone, and, that, and that's great. Mm -hmm. So, so um, um, I don't want to take too much more time now except to have pointed this out, have this on the record for, you know, for, for, for people see, seeing and thinking about these issues that, that um, <coughs> Uh, we sometimes, when we've had, if, if we would have more people who were interested, we've had, we've sometimes have done a short session on the, on the most basic statistics program called SPSS, and a very short introduction, and then, then we've got other, we've got other things which are posted on, on, the, on the documents we have. If anybody is interested who is here or not here today, send us an email. We've got, we've got easily accessible, analyzable, quantitative data for like this, <coughs> but if you don't know how to do it, um, we're not set up to really teach you all the steps along the way. So if there's any one of you who is, who, who knows how to do that kind of thing and wants to do so, great, I will.
people, and, and as I say, a team is often a good way to do it. Okay, so I, I interrupted a little bit, but let's just follow along a little further. If you're, is, it, is this I, an idea for this course only, or is it something you're doing more generally, that you're interested in more, more broadly? Um, this course specifically, so I started a data science minor, um, and I just wanted to see if I could incorporate that into this class, but I, it's Absolutely. Like, I'm seven weeks into the first class I've ever taken of it, so I don't know that much yet. Sure. So I don't know if I'm ready to the point where I could like show that clear correlation. I think I need a bit more time. Yeah. Now, let, it, let me also say, because this is not a statistics course, we're not gonna grade you on statistics. We'll try to help you, but if you want to go beyond what you've learned and you want to you know, try things that are a little bit wild and you make some mistakes in doing so, you know, we won't really penalize you. We'll, we'll, tr if we get a, you know, we'll try to help you if we can, if we get a draft. Or, <coughs> but we'll try to say, we can see what your ideas are. We see that you're trying to do this and you've, you've laid, out, laid out how it works and where, where, where it doesn't. Um, but, we encourage you to, you know, to, to be experimental and try things out, even if you don't know how to do the, the statistical, to, to, to know, you don't know the statistical background, try it out. Then when you have a more advanced course on statistics and big data, you'll see, hey, yeah, I, I, you know, I should have done it this way instead of that way. Um, but you'll, you'll, be, you'll, be more, you'll, more, you'll be more aware of the issues as well as the mistakes you made in the process. Question in the back. Mean either your own or, or the or the questions in, in the in yeah, the in the, in the exam itself. Amazon and sure. Absolutely. Now they were well chosen questions, well put together, taught hard. Right. I mean they're they're in generally no easy right wrong answers, but they they push you, you know, in having these kinds of considerations and thinking of of how how um, how possibly to answer and they're and again as is true in much of life, there's no, there's no one right or wrong way. You've had a question for a while, go ahead. <laughs> Choose the dependent variable or variables. You have to specify a model. You have to say, I would like to use immigration, but then you need to say, here are three other variables that I think might be important. And then if you flip through some of the literature, you may find them important. And, and I mean, this whole course is about development. And we've been going through variable by variable by variable things which affect development. And GNP is one measure of development. You can, as you said, you can replicate can get try to get something like it at, at a county a zip code or other levels you can look at median family income for a zip code and and look at this and get 45,000 cases instead of 3,000 or instead of one <coughs> uh, but the programs don't do I mean I mean yeah. there, there are ways it, it, it can be done but the more you are self-conscious of what you're doing and and, re, and, and, are, and think about the implications of including or excluding. Yes, state is a great program, highly highly reputed. Lots of people use it here, and it's quite accessible at the at the early stages. A little a little harder than SPSS, but uh, it's cheap. this course oh. we got tons of data sitting there waiting for you okay okay so, so that's fine now I, 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 I maybe I'm you're making me realize I didn't say that that was my mistake so apologies 
everybody, we have lots of data. Okay, so course documents say, and they have the titles of the readings, but if you scroll on down below the readings, there, there are things which say, crosswalk file between cities and school districts. So if you want to analyze school districts and combine them with the socioeconomic characteristics of the citizens, you've got to have a crosswalk that is a data file which will say which cities or which zip codes match up as best as possible with school districts because they're not coterminous and so forth. So we've got, we've got lots of data there and I would say Send, send us or probably probably me an email if you're interested in, in doing some kind of study like this and we can point you toward data we have here and or there are tons of things which you can download. The reason to be cautious about downloading and starting with, with I'd say with anything that's, if, you're, if it's new to you, there's a startup time. I mean, you've got to figure out what the acronyms mean, does it run, I mean, so generally we've got data which have been which is the data which are here in the course documents are relatively cleaned and reasonably documented compared to some other things which you may be able to download for one city easily from the census. You can get Reading, Pennsylvania, but you get, if you get if you got Reading, Pennsylvania, and you see the GNP or the level of that, something like it, median family income, and you get the percent the percentage immigrants. How do you how do you answer that question? I mean, the simple the simple normal answer is you can't don't have the right data. And you, you need variations normally on lots of variables. And if you, if you, and if, but if, I mean, is everybody familiar with the idea of spuriousness? What's spuriousness and how does it relate to it? Anybody? Okay. Uh, Richard Florida <laughs> did an infamous paper uh, and with his, with his book, which we, which we adapted in some of the readings, The Rise of the Creative Class. And he, and he, sh he showed that the percentage of gays, and I think he had met, yeah, metro area data. So not, it would be, say, the five county area of Chicago. Cook County, Lake County, Will County, so I mean, lots of counties around here, led to so percentage gays led, led to growth in tech jobs. This were things like Google, Facebook, um, grew more if you had more gays. Okay, so when he published that, he said, wow, this is pretty wild stuff. Um, and so there was a lot of debate about it and people, and, and he, he, was, he was, you know, making policy implications. Okay, so I, I, I called him up with his co-author and said, I'm, you know, I'm a friend, I'd like to try to help you pursue this further, but did you try this? You? And so when we talked a little bit, I had the impression that he hadn't really analyzed the data very carefully. So I said, would you be willing to share the data? And he said, yes. So he sent me the data. Okay, <coughs> uh, or, uh, sorry, he sent it to me. I gave it to a research assistant who worked on it for six months. And I said, what are you finding, you know, after a couple of weeks and months? He said, oh, Florida's right. Everything is working fine. I mean, I've done it about, I've run about 150 analyses, and almost all of them, it fits. The, get, the gays are positively related, and it looks as if Florida, Florida's right. Okay, so I said, can you let me try it? So I took the data over the weekend, and the first thing I looked at was, college graduates. Then I looked at these, that is, I looked at the correlation between gays and college graduates, and that was very high. If you have a high relationship to two th between two things like this, that means if you only include one and not both of them, you get what's called a misspecification. So if you try to estimate A and B, and these things are correlated 0.9, you'll have a very, very hard time separating, separating them out. If they're correlated 0.5, then maybe you can, but the higher, the larger the number of cases, the smaller the units, 
the more likely you are able to separate them out. Whereas if you have things that are correlated 0.9, or let's say one, because you're only studying one country, or you only have one city, then, then okay. So the concept of spuriousness is if you don't have the right thing in your stata specified multiple regression, you put in one of these but not the other, you will get the effects of both and you won't know which is the driver. Is it really education or is it percent gaze? So in, in the paper which is published in the book called The Cities and Entertainment Machine, we have a chapter where I, I go through county data. I'm, I can't remember all the things I did. I think they did metro. I did. I ran it for metros. I ran it for counties. I think I ran it, maybe I ran it for zip codes. I, I can't remember. But l later on we have. <laughs> and, if, and if you look at this, say for, okay, so for, there, there are the roughly, 3,000 counties in the U.S. There's something like, I should know off the top of my head, there may be 95 metro areas. Metros are bigger, but that means you have more spuriousness because if you have all of the counties, you know, five counties in, in the Chicago area, where gays are living, where college graduates are living, and where these tech jobs are, growing may be almost unrelated because because they're so they're, they're also a small part of the whole exacerbated. So basically the more you can get down to, to lower smaller units, zip codes, whatever, then you get a bigger N and they ease then instead of having a correlation of 0.9, it may go down to 0.5 or to 0.3 if you get down to zip codes, then you can separate out the effects of gays from college graduates. <coughs> um, <coughs> and so basically what we did was when we got to um, the smaller units and the clearer, better models, this fell to zero. And the, re the, the main driver was the college graduates that were driving but we didn't know that in advance. We thought, you know, if this is right, this is really, this is really going to be dynamite. But, and so, I mean, Florida and Gates, who did the initial study, did not really argue ever that gays were the simple, narrow cause. They said this is a, a bigger indicator of other things like tolerance. And if you have people in a city or a metro area that are more tolerant, then they're gonna look for more talented people who can come and work in that city, and then is if and that means the city is more open to more kinds of people, immigrants from abroad, people whose English is not so good, and so forth. And so <coughs> in that way, you'll have uh, potentially uh, more talent that in turn may lead to more jobs. And so so in that argument, the driver is not gaze, but it is tolerance. And so Florida talked about the three T's. Technology, talent, um, technology, tolerance, and tolerance. So tolerance is, is, what, is what the gaze were meant to, 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 to measure. So what I then did in the paper was to take not a demographic measure of gaze, because if you have more gays in a, imagine, imagine you have two, two metro areas. And gay, gays are a very small pro proportion of the population. Most people who you're, who you're trying to capture, uh, that is if you want to say how tolerant is Los Angeles compared to Chicago, and I just gave this example that the city leaders have been very different in the two cities. If you want to try to get a sense of how tolerant are the citizens, you need ideally a survey of citizens individuals and we have that and we've used it for instance in the in the same book where this came out it's called the DDB the, the uh, <coughs> was it's the second I think largest advertising firm in the world and they, they give this data out to show people that they're concerned with understanding consumer dynamics and lots of things so they're they're about they're about um, 
about 100,000 American citizens asked the same questions for 30, 40 years. Big, big survey. And in Europe, there are, there are similar, there are Eurostat, Eurostat data, which give you this for the, the, the different European countries. <laughs> so if you then look at tolerance um, in not just, and so here, again, I would, I would caution you, if you're, if you're asking the bigger questions as, as you started with, if you choose any two cities, maybe they will be high on one thing and low on another in ways that may be misleading. Well, let's, let's put it differently. That is, if you, have, if, you have, if you have immigration and GSP, and you have, say, um, two cities, and they're here and here, does that say that every city that which has low immigration has low GNP? If you have an N of two, you're on shaky ground. If you have an N of 10, it gets better. If you have an N of 50, it gets better. So imagine if you have 10, and they, they look like this. If you have 50, and it looks like that, then you're on stronger ground. If you have 10,000, you're on stronger ground still. However, if you have, let's say, 50, and you have cases over here, and over here, and over here, and over here, then you, if you draw, try to draw a, a, a scatter plot line, try, this is called the regression line, it would, you know, the, the best, to try to minimize the distance between all these points, it may look like that. No relationship. So in this sense, these are interrelated decisions of research design, causal modeling, model formulation, and, and the, the problem is, one problem for you uh, uh, is that you tend to get these parcelized in different parts of your courses. You can get a course on statistics, and the, and the statistics department will show you how to, how to They'll, they'll say, well, you've got to have two or three courses in math before you can take any of our courses. You've got to know calculus. You've got to know algebra at a high level. Then you take elementary statistics, and then we'll show you how to derive the equations that will give you the proof that this is really correct, that it's derived from a big, okay. So you get strong statistical training, but it doesn't, they don't tell you you need a bigger N, you know, simple, simple point like that. Okay, see, so if you're majoring in big data, they're going to tell you in every course what you really need is big data, okay? But they may not teach you as much statistics, okay? If you, instead you take an economics 101 course, they'll, they'll say, well, maybe you don't really want to use GNP, maybe you should use something else, and maybe, I mean, that, so that is, each course will give you some, but what we generally are particularly weak at is joining these pieces together and especially like something like research design. Uh, almost no one talks about how, how, to, I mean, how do you do the study? What, you know, do you want to study zip codes, counties, metro areas, which, which, where and why? And the way that people still mostly learn this at a, at a document at a university like this is by wor working as a research apprentice on a, on a research project. There are a few books or a few courses, but not much. So it looks as if we're getting some things, some things listed here, which are which are very good. <laughs> when you're ready, I'll let you, I'll let you introduce them. Uh, appreciate that. So there. Yeah, I just want to put some basic. I mean, I know we do have some. Uh, I know we have some go data. Ahead. Go ahead and talk about this. Yeah. So my handwriting is very bad. I'm sorry, but. Uh, if you do want to sort of go and explore your own data, so I'll, we'll just take like one case of the immigration as an example. So the, you, depending on what kind of data you want, I would, these are the places I, would always, I always start my own research with. So if it's an opinion or survey question, so if you want to know how do people in California feel about increased immigration or something, NORC, which is here at the University of Chicago, uh, is the go-to place for sort of all survey and opinion data. 
um, and they have the ability, you have the ability to kind of go to a micro scale, depending on sort of what the survey is and stuff. So that's where I would start for that. For yeah. They have a research library. They also have most of their surveys summarized online. So if you want to answer an answer to the question that Rishi just posed, you know, how many people say, you know, I'm in favor of more immigrants, I like to work with immigrants, or immigrants are dangerous, they should be kept out, and so forth. You have a whole series of items which will show this over the last 50 years, and you can see those generally for the whole U.S. and see, and, and see those changes online. And so you can look at it if it's cold weather, look, just, just look for GSS, General Social Survey, and that, that's the Newark, uh, that's the North survey that, that's the counterpart of this, or this DDV. Okay. And it's international as well. The international version is called the International Social Survey Program. Okay, or the World, the World Value Survey is the Michigan counterpart of that, but, but go ahead. Yeah, okay, so that's opinion survey. Um, then if you want sort of a, uh, data on sort of more economic variables and sort of business sentiment and stuff like that, the top line, place to first start is the main Federal Reserve website. Their engine is called FRED. Um, and then also what people kind of forget to do is there are, the Federal Reserve is made up of regional banks and all of the regional banks study their particular region very closely. So particularly on labor market issues, um, you might, you'll be able, if you look at the San Francisco Fed for California, you'll be able to get uh, really good data on sort of like county level immigration patterns probably. Um, surveys of business uh, owners, surveys of sort of uh, workers in the area. They do all this research. Chicago has a Fed uh, too, so for the Midwest. So I would go start at Fred for the national stuff and then go down to the regional bank level. Um, and the Federal Reserve has, in my opinion, probably the best data uh, on this kind of stuff. And then for demographics and sort of socioeconomic questions, so race, ethnicity, education level, that kind of stuff. Again, top line, you can start at the census, um, but then census also has this thing called the American Community Survey, um, and all this data is available. You can go to the library, I think they have a good tutorial on the library website about how to use the American Community Sur Survey, um, and then that breaks it down to uh, like sort of neighborhood levels, census tract levels, um, and they do a lot of interesting sort of surveys in the same vein as NORC sometimes, but um, it's another resource uh, that I would look at. So start with Start with these, and there's obviously tons of data out there, but just I would start here, see what you can find, and then go from there. Yeah. But yes. realistically, if you want to look at all of those, you can't do this in one quarter and one term paper. Yeah, it's it totally too, depends on what your project is. Yeah. So, so the way to try to do it is to work with a, a research team that's already done that, or that, as I said, on our, our Canvas site, we have built files that include data from all these kinds of sources. They're all in one file. You put it into this data program and you can have citizen surveys, economic activity, census characteristics, and look at how they all, they, they each may have some impact and you can measure each of them, each of them separately with, with data from each of the sources. But depending on your question, these, these, these may well be available, but Talk to folks who are a little further along before you dive in and get a sense of what you can realistically do in one month or six months or one year. And we have we have someone who's worked at NORC for how many years? Um, I've worked there for almost five years. Okay. Across um, the NIF National Communication Survey, the NFC Study.com. Any advice for students thinking about student papers or BAs um, or MAs? Or whatever? Um, the comment of how complex it is to manipulate these databases is correct. This is study is impossible to look at people who have used these databases because um, so much data is just a huge amount of information that you have to wade through. Okay. Will it go to census tracts and then flock to each other? 
Yeah, I mean, so so what happened, the, the, if you look, the way that the regional banks do it is they run their, each bank runs their own research operations. So depending on sort of what issues are of importance in that particular banking region, um, the, the, the research group will like do a paper on it or collect data on it and stuff like that. Some of the things are standardized across um, all of the regional banks. So there's like a business sentiment uh, survey that they run every three months and they like poll, I don't know, thousand business leaders in their sort of regional area and then they publish survey data on that. Others are more specific if there's like a particular, like I know um, the Southeastern Bank did a really good paper on like the impact of like hurricanes on the economy and stuff like that. So like that's obviously not relevant to the Midwest, but uh, so just kind of that, that, that you, you'll have to explore sort of where you're, where you're interested in. But if, if you take a look at some of their publications, or I, I went to some of their presentations by the, by the research staff, uh, then I went up afterward and I said, you know, everything you said about the whole Midwest concerned production and investment. You said nothing about shopping, consumption, retail trade, conventions, or people making a decision to come to a convention who might want to come here because they want to go to the symphony, or they wanted to swim in the lake, or they wanted to uh, do, do something that was more consumption oriented. And is this something you might want to consider? And he said, well, maybe. So he came to one of our conferences. He said, okay, and he called me up afterwards, said, could you, could you help to organize a session with the Federal Reserve of Chicago? And so Ed Glazer at Harvard, who's the, probably the top urban economist in the world, and I did it together. <laughs> and we had 80 top economists from the, from the, from, or they could come from anywhere in the country, but they were most, mostly from Chicago and in, in the, in the area. And at the end of the day, roughly 30, I'd say 30 were convinced and with us, 30 were definitely opposed and throwing, throwing tomatoes at us as, as they probably had been before. And 30 were, were somewhere in the middle. But, I mean, but to, to, to move 30 people from being, you know, uninterested to saying, yes, we really ought to be doing more of this, and I now see some specific ways of doing so, shows that, that what we fill, we, that is, we're filling a vacuum in, in all the social sciences, economics, sociology, and this is what I've said six or seven times, but it's also true in, within each of, these, each of these data sources, that you tend to get things that are more jobs, investment, production, work-oriented, as if the only people reason, the only reason people live is to work and work and work, and they never go to church, they never have any time for their families, they never do anything with their kids, they never listen to any music, they never eat any food, they never buy any clothes. Okay, so, so the, the, so the second, <coughs> when I then talk with other people, I mean, I, 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 call, I call up, and so I've been working with this stuff for decades, so one, one day I, I called up a guy at the census in Washington and he said, you know, do you have anything, any way that we could get some, some stuff about types of, types of organizations like cafes or um, that is economic activities at a smaller level than, than, the, than the county? He said, oh yeah, we, we, have, it, we have it online. He said, oh really, I I'd never read about it. He said, well, it's not published anywhere. There are no reports from it, and it's, it's not in any of the libraries. So I said, well, then how can I get it? Send us an order, send us $250, and we'll send you one CD. So I said, okay, well, what if I want it for two years? Well, then send, a, you know, write a bigger check. So I wrote several big checks. I waited three months to six months, and I got two or three CD-ROMs. This, and this was 20, 20, 30 years ago. So we, so, however, if you look at the publications that come from most people using all of these data, especially the urban economists, the urban geographers, the urban sociologists, they tend to use county business patterns. That, that's it's capitalized. This is, this is the count, this, it's the census source of county data. And as I said, there are 3,000 counties. But if you only use counties, you'll find things that may be correlated 0.9, whereas if you go down and you get instead 45,000 zip codes, 
the 0.9 may fall to 0.5 or 0.3. So you can separate out because you're getting to smaller and smaller units. So, <coughs> so I've, been, I've been publishing now for 10 years saying everybody, or everybody, we gotta pay more attention to the zip codes as well as the counties. There's still a very small number of people who are using the smaller units of, of uh, smaller units of data, <coughs> and including both production and consumption in order to study things like happiness. Right? But Ed Glazer, yeah, there is, is some. Is anybody in the class who sent me the the paper from Ed Glazer? That, 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 that wasn't you from because we because we one one of you asked a question about um, crime. That was a follow up on crime. Anyway. Ed Glazer had, had two papers. Ed Glazer is talking more the way that I am here. That is, he tries to join the, the so-called amenities. That is, amenities is an economic concept which is non-market goods, including clean air, January temperature, attitudes toward immigrants, schools. All these are amenities because you don't buy them by the way you buy McDonald's. And so in that sense, you have to get data from governments or others that, that are providing it. <coughs> and, it and it's more complicated. But, <coughs> but there's, they're a stronger part of the whole GNP. If you look at the GNP, business investment is about 18% of the GNP. Consumer goods and services are something like 70%. But if you read the financial sections of the Wall Street Journal, they talk about business investment. They don't talk about do you buy a refrigerator or, more specifically, which cafe do you go to and why? But which cafe you go to and which dress you buy and are your sho shoes red or green, those are much bigger economic decisions than business investment in dollars and cents or Chinese yen or rubles or, or whatever. So, so, so 100 years ago, Everybody was hungry and poor and, and focusing on work and the basic simple things. And so we had simple theories that poverty and human ecology and competition and domination, that's the way the world worked. No longer true, including in China. So we have here, you heard briefly <laughs> last time, Professor Kiji, the Chinese are, are rapidly going ahead and studying consumption, the arts, entertainment, and it's phenomenal and it's great to see the quality and the range and the richness of the data that the Chinese are collecting and they're way ahead of the US in many of the data sources which they have available. And they're investing in smart people and sending them around like Professor Kiji right here who's, who's, who's been quiet and she's, she said she'll talk to us more publicly next quarter. So we're looking forward to that so you can come around with the global local politics next quarter when they maybe will. And she, she's got things published in English which you can, you can see. But, but basically these are new developments within, within the urban area, within all these disciplines. And so I'm, I'm pointing them out using this as a base but also to point out how you can, you can go beyond 95% of the publications that are there on these kinds of issues, even from top experts at the Federal Reserve Bank, even at NORC, and even the census, the census people who, who, who collect and, and do the first reports on these data, and many of the, the academics using them. Any, any, okay, that's more methodological. I'll just, I'll, I'll just throw one last thing on yeah. the paper. If you're kind of looking at this and like freaking out because you haven't like done any data analysis or anything, uh, I'm, I, I think Professor is also perfectly acceptable. For a final paper, you could do like a research proposal, right? You could come up with a proposal yeah. for a project that you could maybe execute uh, for a BA thesis down the road or something. That doesn't mean that you don't look at any data. It means that maybe you go through these sources and say, these are the types of data that are available. This is my question. This is how I might think about sort of executing this project. And this is a new source of data that I could add to sort of supplement uh, the existing research out there. So a lot of times people do sort of a, a research proposal and that knocks out uh, a significant portion of what they have to do for their 
VA thesis because you can kind of focus it on the literature that we've yeah. gone through so you can use it as a literature review and then look at like these are the types of data out there this is how I might analyze it uh, but then not actually do the analysis that's perfectly fine too uh, yeah. yes 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 and and so not only for this course paper where you could start but for a complete BA or MA and maybe a PhD you could do the same thing maybe not just call it a proposal sure. but you don't need to do deep original uh, big data analysis in, in a BA, an MA, or, or, or a PhD. And there are many ways to, to um, but, but, you, but, but that, I mean, that, that's, that's one, one take. The second take, the reason we've spent this amount of time on this today is this is important for all of you, even if you never look at any original data of this sort, but as, you, as you're reading things in the books and in the papers in this course and other courses and you're listening to people talking on the media, you're listening to President Trump arguing with someone at the World Bank or you know, President Macron in France, Putin, I mean, they, they'll, if they say different things, some of this is just rhetoric, but some of these are numbers. And the question is, what are the numbers and how do they put them together? And it's, it, part of it is ideology, but it's not purely invented. There's a, there, 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 I mean, I spent a lot of time doing congressional testimony, working with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> um, that is, that, or that is uh, yeah, how did I just, a, a sentence on that. In the, in the 70s, the Congressional Budget, the, the U.S. Congress created the Congressional Budget Office. They hired a bunch of PhDs. And they then started doing research for the U.S. Congress and feeding them into the committees of the U.S. Congress. And then they would have hearings and they would bring in testimony from the PhD analysts from the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, Alice Rivlin was the director of it, did an excellent job, you know, raised the profession. Okay, so then people like the mayors would go in and they say, you know, we need more money for cities. And they say, what's your evidence? Uh, well, we need more money for cities. Everybody knows it. We have, we have riots. If we, don't, if we don't get more money, we'll have more riots. Oh, so so then, then, then they say, well, show us, show us that there's a relationship between riots and money. Is it negative or not? And so the U.S. Conference of Mayors started holding, holding, holding meetings with people like me and academics and, and hold, with mayors and academics and then professionals from, this, from the Congressional Budget Office and others. And we started with, we went through 200, 300 people. We boiled it down to four. So there were four of us who were, who were the key consultants with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. <coughs> and there were, there were basically two economists, one public administration guy, and I did everything else. <laughs> okay, So I did politics, political leadership, lobbying, all kinds of stuff. And so, so for, <laughs> for a good 10 years, I, I was in Washington you know, what, once a month or so, and I was on the phone three, th 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 three nights a week. And my name was on very almost nothing. The major reports were signed by a mayor. So when Mayor Moonland Drew of New Orleans signed it, I may have written it. Okay. So that 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 kind of thing is going on all the time. But my point is, the there was a ratcheting up in the in the in the research that was used to inform this kind of policy in the 70s and 80s. And it's not and it is much more serious now than it was. Uh, and, and, there, and I work with lots of individual mayors. Lots of mayors in middle-sized and smaller towns would say, you know, I, I know I've been mayor for one term, but you know, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a, a master's of public policy or master's of public administration, a master's of, 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 of getting, a, getting a, a degree and learn how to do some of this kind of work so I can do it or use it myself. And so I've worked with mayors in Northbrook, Waukegan, and then staff in Chicago and, 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 and the like. <coughs> As well, as well as nationally based on our work with it. So my, my point is there's an interpenetration of the same kinds of conversations we're having today with the mayors, with the, with the people in, in, in top policy making in Washington. And, and I've spent summers, I mean, in those years, I spent some full summers in, at the Brookings Institution, at the Urban, Urban Institute, Department of Housing and Urban Development, working with the White House staff and, 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 and so forth. <coughs> And they were all, we had these same conversations with, with, uh, with everybody, and they're just gradually, gradually coming up year by year as we get better data and better analysis.
Okay, so, so the, the point of the story is not that any, maybe none of you will ever do any of this original data analysis, but if you're aware and you're sensitive to the number of cases, the seriousness, to constructing the model, to the, to the ways that you put these together and how much these will change the results, you can ask in a hearing if the analysts have considered, for instance, if they say gays are the cause of tech jobs, you can say, did you assess the importance of college graduates as well? And he may say yes, and here's the result, or he may say, uh, I can uh, give me another week and I'll do so. Okay, so, so that is, being sensitive of where the specific findings come from is a critical thing for you to be sensitive to. Yeah. Does it always um, look like that in terms of when you make a more granular um, look at counties, zip codes, um, will the correlation go down in most cases for counties? Other things equal, the, the correlation tends to go down because you've got more variation and larger numbers of, of possibilities. However, because you've got a larger N and larger number of cases, the statistical significance may go up. So a point a point three um, R or beta statistic may be highly significant if you have 45,000 cases or is it maybe insignificant if you only have 25 cases? Okay. And I, I would say in, in these years when I was starting on this, I got invited to Sweden several times to work with the top, the top Swedish people, the top Swedish city people, because like China today, the Swedes had a lot more money than we did here, but they didn't, they didn't, and they were, they were, they basically they were they were they wanted to implement like the Chinese. The Swedes were very concerned with welfare state egalitarianism. They wanted all the Swedes to have the same access to the same welfare services as I talked about the Chinese libraries. And so, so they said, we can't do some of these things if the towns are too small. And so many of the northern European towns, not southern but northern European, abolished their small towns and created consolidated them into big cities, which are roughly say like American counties or even metro areas. Uh, and so but that was not without a big fight. And, and this also then was done by the Russians and under the Russians before 1989, the Hungarians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, uh, et cetera. And so the first thing that happened after 1989 when the Berlin Wall went down and local government through Eastern Europe was what? What was the first law they passed? They abolished those Swedish-inspired big metro, met, Swed, let's say Swedish and English. The Swedish and the English were the leaders. The English built the biggest ones. And some people have blamed Brexit and the alienation of young people in Britain today on the fact that they've lost their little local governments, their, little, their ability to participate in smaller neighborhood associations, which you did have in England in the 1930s, but they were abolished after World War II, with first with the labor governments, then with Margaret Thatcher, and so today you just have social media and angry, uh, angry people, and the party system is falling apart. So, <laughs> right. so quick comments. That is, I, I think you can hear the train linking these comments together, and I'm using some anecdotes to show the specificity, but to show that these are not just you know, abstract things that happen out there, that variables get added, new, new ways of thinking, such as consumption as well as production, only comes after you, you, you begin to see how, how critical it is in shifting, um, in shifting support. So just, just one example on that. I, it, I mentioned what this, but how, how if you were an advisor to a president, could you document what I just said? That you should pay attention to consumption as well as production. I gave you the answer to this about two weeks ago. Ronald, I'll, and I'll fill in a little more, I'll start to fill in. Ronald Reagan was the first president to do surveys every single night. And they would ask, how, how good a job is the president doing? Simple, general question. But they also knew what the president had said that day on television or to the press. And when he talked about the economy, 
generally americans said the president's doing a good job when he talked about school prayer and every child should have to go to a school prayer in every school in america and they should pay attention to religion more than they are now reagan's rating went down <laughs> okay. so his social program was too conservative for most americans but his fiscal program low taxes and try to grow the economy that's what people wanted to do so in that sense that, that is the, the, the separation of the social from the fiscal and the importance of both in driving votes and then in driving budgets and then in driving success politically and economically and, in, and then as measured by NORC, citizen happiness, what makes people happy. It's not money, it's not their job, their families and their personal relations and their, their, their more intimate and consumption lives are much more important than the economic. And economists are showing this in their analysis of the happiness data from NORC. Okay, I'll close there. Um, we, um, we've covered, covered a lot of different kinds of things than usually we do, but I'm, I'm glad to have at least you know, one, one session on this. We didn't, we didn't just try to teach you SPSS or regression. We've sort of given you the things which you, I mean, you, you can learn that on your own. You can get an SPSS textbook, you know, it's, it's easy. Putting the pieces together is what's hard, and that's, that's what I've, why I've tried to point to where, where you can look for ways of doing it, and uh, we'll try to help you out. Look forward to more. <laughs>